Our gospel reading this morning comes from Mark, the 11th chapter. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of the Lord. <coughs> hey, good morning, everybody. Pastor Ernie again here with Joyce Lutheran Church, and we're delighted to have you with us. Today is Palm Sunday, and we're going to look at that story here in just a moment. Uh, but you may be hearing people talk about Holy Week, like this is Holy Week, um, beginning today on Palm Sunday. And um, I remember, well, almost half my life I really spent outside of the church. So I can remember, you know, when I wasn't very familiar with a lot of the church words and church terms like Holy Week. What is Holy Week? Um, well, Holy Week um, is the last week in the season of Lent, which began on Ash Wednesday. That was back in February, I think. And uh, so we've been 40 days, not including Sundays. And um, so this is the last week. And it starts today with Palm Sunday. And what it does is it kind of chronicles the final days of Jesus' earthly ministry before his crucifixion and resurrection. And so there were some critical pieces that were happening here in these last days of Jesus' life, um, <clears throat> at least life on earth. Um, and so uh, next slide there if you would please Aaron so Holy Week starts today and it looks at the time when Jesus entered Jerusalem he'd been traveling around and had been to Jerusalem before but this was kind of the final showdown if you will this is the the destination that um, the gospel writers have been leading us to anticipate where some very very important things were going to happen and that's what we're going to chronicle in this Holy Week so Palm Sundays today that's when he entered into Jerusalem uh, Maundy Thursday is the day before he was apprehended and crucified, and that was the last time he's with his disciples, and he's giving them some final instructions, and he also um, brings about what we call um, the Lord's Supper, or, or what you may have seen as the Last Supper. I think it was da Vinci, or somebody has a very famous painting of Jesus at the Last Supper. Well, that happened on Thursday, and we call that Maundy Thursday. Now, we're not having a Maundy Thursday service this year, um, just because of all the extenuating circumstances. But if you've been with us before, you probably celebrated that with us. Now, of course, there's Good Friday, which is an ironic name, isn't it? Because, of course, that's the Friday when Jesus is apprehended and he's actually put to death on a cross. So it's a little weird to call that Good Friday. But truth of the matter is, um, in hindsight, it, it, on the other side of the resurrection, it was a Good Friday because it led us to the last part of Holy Week, which is a week from today, which is Easter Sunday, where we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, right? How God, who uh, sent his son to die to pay the price for our sin, and yet sin and death did not have the last word with Jesus, and sin and death is not the last word for us. So see how there's a, this trajectory of this story. So that's what we're doing over the next um, several days, over the next seven days between now and Easter Sunday. Next slide, Aaron. Now, one of the challenges is I was looking at the passages for today and thinking about being with you. Like, what do we want to talk about today? Um, here's one of the things that is just true for me and probably some of you. Like, I've read this story. I don't know how many times I've read this story, um, not just in looking at Bible reading, but of course, preparing for this season of the year every year for 20 some years now. I mean, part of the challenge for you and me is that this story, these last days of Jesus can be so familiar. Like, it'll just go in one ear and out the other. It's kind of hard sometimes um, to have uh, for the story to have an impact because we've just heard it too many times. It can just go in one ear and out the other. You know what I'm talking about? And I think we have a similar experience sometimes of movies like this one. Star Wars. Now, um, this movie came out in the summer of 1977. I was 11 years old and I remember driving with on my bicycles with my buddies and we went up to Capitol Plaza had a 
they had a movie theater there in Austin. I remember going to see that and it was a mind blower. Like the, the special effects and stuff, the story. I mean, this is a classic movie and we knew it from day one. We knew this, this is an amazing movie. That's just going to, it's going to have legs. It's going to be a classic. Um, and it has been, and not just this one, but all the ones that came after it. I think just between you and me, I think this is the best one. The very first one. Others of you might argue with me and that's fine. Um, now, and I'm wondering how many times have I seen Star Wars? I don't know, but it's got to be, I don't know, 30 or 40 times maybe. And it wasn't just my own interest, but when we had kids and they liked Star Wars too, and especially my son, Nick, you know, boys tend to gravitate to this, but not just boys. Anyway, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. Um, and it's not that it's not enjoyable. It's still a great movie. It's got a great plot. It's got great characters, but you know, the, the twists and turns of, the plot and so on it just doesn't hit me the same way because I've just seen it too many times. Or how about this next movie, <clears throat> which I think is hands down Will Ferrell's best movie, and it's not close. Of course, you know this is the movie Elf. Now, what's interesting about Elf and other movies, by the way, is that it's seasonal, right? This is a Christmas movie, and so we'll start to see it on TV and streaming a lot, particularly about, about Thanksgiving time. So this, and of course, there's lots of other seasonal movies. It's a Wonderful Life is a very, very classic seasonal Christmas movie. And I'll bet you have some others. This is my favorite Christmas movie now. It came out in 2003. So this year is going to be 18 Christmases that we've had this movie. And here's the thing about seasonal movies is we watch them pretty much every year at least once. And I'm telling you, I've seen this movie at least once and usually more every single year since it first came out. Again, fantastic movie. I still laugh because it's hilarious. Will Ferrell is a genius in this movie. But again, it's still enjoyable, but I'm very, very familiar with it. So it's lost lots a little bit of its, of its impact on me. How about the next one? Um, Aaron. Now, this is a fairly new series, Game of Thrones. And I was just chatting with um, Aaron, who's our AV guy right now. He's doing, he's helping us with this. Um, and I was telling him, I looked it up. This next month is 10 year anniversary of the first season of Game of Thrones. When I read that, I went, Poof! like, I can't believe this show is 10 years old. I'm pretty sure Game of Thrones did not really catch on the first season. I think maybe it was like the third or fourth season when it really caught on. But it is an amazing show. Is it a classic? I don't know if it's a classic. I think it's really good. I think it's still, it's one of those kinds of streaming series that people like to kind of binge watch. You kind of go through and see them all. Um, there's some other candidates I was going to um, put up Breaking Bad, but I thought, you know, that's probably not one I want to put as an example in the church service. That said, it's a really, really interesting and powerful series. Anyhow, so you can see what I mean. When, we, when we're so familiar with a story, whether it's in a book or whether it's in movies, it can lose some of the impact that it can have for us. Next slide. So here's, I think, what we have an opportunity, you and me, this Holy Week, okay? Because you're going to hear some different stories, some different parts of Jesus' life. And I think here's the opportunity for you and me. If the challenge is that we've heard these stories many times, and maybe for you, you haven't heard it many times, and I'm excited for you because it's a great story. But for others of us who've seen this many times, here's what I think is an opportunity for us to find something new in a familiar story. Yeah, like how do these stories still speak today? So the story that we're going to talk about today, it's not just from 2000 years ago, which would have been interesting, but it's like, well, what does it have to do with me now? Right. So we want to pray that the Lord will reveal something that speaks to your life now, um, whatever the, the struggles you may have, the dreams you may have, the needs you may have, the wants you have now. What I'm hopeful is the Lord is going to speak to us in a new way, even if you've heard this story many, many, many times. Next slide, Aaron. So we have Jesus entering Jerusalem. And like I said, it's kind of like the culmination of his whole story. It's kind of like the, I forget what they call that in movies or in books, right? Like the, the apex or the crescendo, that's a musical term. Anyway, right, this is kind of the, 
the apex, the, the main part of the story. Everything has been building up to this time. And so Jesus has come. And you're like, well, why is he on a donkey? Because in the, in the prophets, it was said that the Messiah would come riding on um, a donkey like this. And so he's fulfilling prophecy. Um, generations of people were hopeful that sometime, somehow, our God, our Father, would send a Messiah who would restore Israel to Jewish rule. Because they'd been ruled from Babylonians by Assyrians and then the Romans. I mean, it had been many, many years since they'd had their own country where they could be the people of God, Israel, under Israeli rule. And they had hoped and prayed for that. Now, you can see that they're super excited about Jesus coming, right? And that's clear and obvious. And you see them putting their cloaks down. That's kind of like ancient Israel version of the red carpet that we see. It's kind of that idea. Like this is a VIP. This is like a rock star is showing up in Jerusalem. But it's, a, it's an act of devotion that they're placing their cloaks, which is kind of like an outer coat covering. They would lay it on the ground. I wonder if some of them saved that. Especially later on, they may have realized, holy smokes, Jesus was the son of God. I'm wondering if somebody kept that and held it. I don't know. But here's what I know. We see people, for instance, in this picture, and clearly that are excited. But here's what struck me this. I don't think I'd ever thought about this before. So as I was praying, Lord, show me something new. Speak to me in a new way. Here's what I'm pretty sure. Some of the people were really excited about Jesus' arrival. But here's what I also believe. There were others who were not excited about Jesus, who'd kind of seen it all. They've been there. They've done that. And they are kind of cynical because this Jesus was not the first time like a prophet were to emerge. I mean, um, rebellion from the Jews was not a new concept with Jesus. This had happened a number of times over the years. And every single time the, the resistance had been crushed by the Romans. And so there were people who I think were just not quite excited. They're like, nah, this is going to happen again. We've seen this before. This goes nowhere. Next slide. What crept in is cynicism, right? Which is, I looked it up. It's a distrust of human sincerity or integrity. In this case, I think there were people who heard what people were saying about Jesus and yet did not believe. In fact, we know that happened a lot. Some people believed him to be the Messiah and followed him, but a lot of people did not. And people in Jerusalem were not just his followers. There were lots and lots of people in Jerusalem. This was the Passover season. So this place, Jerusalem, was packed with believers who came to celebrate in Jerusalem. And I'm telling you, there were a lot of people who just were not buying Jesus as Messiah. And I think there are several ways that you and I can get trapped in this cynicism business. I think there's several areas of our current world where we can understand or relate with this notion of cynicism. Next slide. So, for instance, the political process. How do you know when a politician is lying to you? When their lips are moving. That's right, Cheryl. She knows it. I think you can see her, but she's off camera doing something. That's right. Of course, it's the same joke for, for, I think, lawyers is the same joke, whatever, right? Um, the promise of our political process, what's the promise? Is that if we'll elect a new candidate into office or if we'll elect a new majority into office, that they're finally going to bring the change that we've all been waiting for. And of course, if you've been around a while, you've heard this over and over and over. And what changes? Very little, right? And so at some point, you can just be like, you know what, I'm kind of done with this. And I know it's considered bad form when we don't vote because there are people around the world who would love to have that privilege. But there is some understanding of that. When you voted over and over expecting and hoping that change would come and you see again and again the political process, the political class not delivering, at some point you can grow cynical. It happens all the time. How about the next slide, Aaron? Now, marriage is another one. Now, in fact, I was just talking to a young couple um, just this week because they're going to be getting married soon. And I'm so excited for them. Look, there's nothing, I think, more exciting than the prospect of actually beginning life with this other person the Lord has brought into your life. And you found each other and you're hopeful 
and that's great. And I'm so excited for them. And we're going to do some counseling on that. And man, we're going to pray for them. We say, Lord, you're going to bless them and bless the family, hopefully that you bring into their life. Um, but I'll tell you, here's what I know because of having been around and myself having been married over 30 years, uh, it can get rough. And as great as it is on the front end, right? And, and it's exciting and it is, and it's wonderful. But I'll tell you, when the struggles hit, when the adversity hits, when you don't see eye to eye, look, marriage is not for the faint of heart. And if you've been married a while, you know what I'm talking about. And I know some people, A, who've been married and got divorced and they're cynical about marriage, like forget it, I'm done with marriage, not doing it. In fact, I have a relative of mine, not only is he done, he had never got married because he's just seen the kind of the wreckage of the relationships and friends. He's like, forget it, I'm not getting married, period, ever. I'm not even gonna try. You're like, dude, what are you talking about? But at one level, I kind of get it. Because you see lots of times it just, it doesn't work out. People pray and hope and it just, it kind of goes sideways. So people, cynicism, right, can come in. How about the next slide, Aaron? How about when we get a new job? It holds the possibility, finally, here's a job that fits my skill and my experience. Here's a job with coworkers that aren't gonna stab me in the back or talk about me behind my back, who are gonna be productive, like we're gonna work together. And, and a boss who appreciates me, who gets me, who's gonna promote me and help me expand and explore possibilities. And then you talk to this person about a year later, yeah, this place is jacked up, right? It's a new job, but it's still got problems. It may not be the same problems, but there's problems. These people aren't what I thought they'd be. My boss isn't what I, he said he or she said I would be. But here's the funny part is little people, usually, uh, by the way, you're also not what other people expected. And so you can get a little bit of cynicism going in both ways. And I know people who are in jobs and careers that they really don't particularly like, but they're like, man, why would I get out of this mess just to jump into another one? You know, why, why would I do that? Why would I put myself through that? Right? Because there's cynicism that creeps in. Next slide, Aaron. Here's the temptation. Okay. Here's the temptation is to give up, to give up on hope. Okay. Like when our expectations are up here, but then our experience is somewhere way down here. You know what this gap is called? The gap between my expectation and my experience. It's called disappointment. It's called heartbreak, right? And when we get heartbroken, when we get dis disappointed over and over and over, that's what happens is people are what we call cynical. Okay, Aaron, next slide. Cynicism is a distrust of human sincerity or integrity. And I'm telling you, um, next slide, Aaron. There were people who heard Jesus coming. They saw him coming. They were present. But they're like, hey, you young kids, you're all idealistic. You go and, you know, shout Hosanna and lay the palms and put your cloaks. But I'm not going to get sucked in. I'm not doing it again. Why? because it's a protection mechanism, right? It's a defense mechanism to avoid disappointment and heartbreak. And it happens all the time in life and I completely get it. And some of you may be even now experiencing cynicism in some era of your life. And I'm telling you now, I don't blame you. I get it. I've been disappointed many times as probably have you. But here is the deal. What if God can do a new thing in you? Like I'm thinking when some people saw Jesus and they thought maybe, maybe this man from Galilee is the real deal. Maybe this time, maybe this time God can do a new thing. God can establish the kingdom again for Israel. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. There's nothing more sad than to encounter someone who's just completely cynical and has completely lost hope. And on the one hand, I completely get it. I really do. And I'm sure there are places in my life where I'm probably a bit cynical. But here's what I think. I think the Lord is giving this story because of what we know as we go further 
is that not only Jesus delivered, but Jesus exceeded expectations. It just happened in a different way that people were expecting. Here's the question I have for you and me when we go into Holy Week. This question, where in your life do you need hope? Where do you need the Lord to do a new thing? Like, where is the Lord encourage you to trust that your past doesn't have to determine your future, that God really can do something new? And I don't mean in just other people. I'm talking about you. How can you, who may be like a lot of people have been cynical, you've been disappointed, you've been let down. How might the Lord once again plant a seed of hope for you? That's what I want to pray about today, because I think the Lord has something for you even more than what you would ask today. Let's pray. Last slide, Aaron. Lord Jesus, thank you that you did come to Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday 2000 plus years ago. And it's true, Lord, there were many who said Hosanna and they celebrated and they were grateful and they were hopeful. And then there were other people who are like some of us who were a bit cynical. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I've gotten my hopes crushed too many times. I think I'm sitting this one out. And the truth is, Lord, sometimes we do that. Sometimes we get so frustrated, we just decide we're going to sit this one out. But I pray, Lord, that you would restore. Bring us a restoration of hope, Lord. Show us in those places in our life. We all have them. The places in our life where we're kind of beaten down, where we're kind of disappointed, where things have not worked out the way we had hoped. Lord, maybe by your grace, plant that seed of light and hope that we might cry out to you, Hosanna in the highest heaven. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.